Thank you so much, Dr. Oluba. Started off with um, frameworks, now innovative economic policies, and next we're going to talk about the, the role that the law, the legal system plays in this. And I'd like to invite Mr. Kingsley Uhe, Consultancy Africa Intelligence. Can we put our hands together for him, please? Uh, I would like to thank the convener of this uh, conference on behalf of Consultancy Africa for extending the invitation to us. I'll be talking on the topic, can legal framework and regulatory intervention orchestrate innovation? Now, the, the first point I want to make here is this. We, the legal framework itself and regulatory intervention is for, a specific, is for a specific purpose. There are motive why framework are imposed on a set or, or specific situation in a society. Now, in my highlight here, I said to move towards a government control structure for reaching unsaved and underserved portion of the population. Now, I, I drew out three case studies using different countries, one in India, in Nigeria, and the United uh, States. The first point, I'm going to make a general statement first of all. I, yesterday, so speakers here were saying that rules are just rules. That's what they are. And it is the cultural component and common cause, in quote, common cause mentality that orchestrates innovation in society and not legal framework itself. Now, what I mean by this is that um, uh, it is the legal, the legal framework itself mainly encourages and creates engine room for manipulation of perception. That is, it, the, what legal framework does is to manipulate perception, whether in business or in administration. In India, the motivation for creating legal, uh, legal framework in microfinance is the desire to to establish a new reputation for banking and financial institutions from the impression of corruption created by lack of regulation in the past. Now, before now in India, financial institutions were not regulated. What we had were clusters of non-governmental organizations who were dishing out loans to individuals and organizations. Now, at a point, they decided to leverage they, are, they start to leverage their position with the government by getting registered as an approved organization, of a financial institution with the state. At a point, they now had access to enough capital, enough capital to, to impact on their immediate community. Here, as I said, the key innovation for India here is that uh, the non-governmental uh, organization, which were serving as ad hoc microfinance institution in the absence of true servicing of the financial borrowing and saving needs of the poorest section of the fine. Now, in India, the key innovation in India were non-governmental organizations who were serving as ad hoc microfinance institution in the absence of true servicing of the financial borrowing and saving needs of the poorest section of the country. They met. They used the opportunity, they leveraged with the government, created enough uh, a capital with which they registered themselves, and then they became a sanctioned organization within the system. Now, the target population for development via uh, microfinance stimulation in India had little or no trust for pre-existing financial institutions in India. There was no trust between the underserved, or those I call underserved, in it, that's the underprivileged in India who needed little loans here and there to do business. So what we now had was that this targeted population lost, there was a loss of confidence in established institutions in the state of India. And at the end of the day, the, there was a tendency for, from this microfinance organization who later got a sanction from the, from the authority in India to leverage their position with like regulatory authorities and increase their access to the kind of capital they will need to see large-scale growth. Now, if we come back to Nigeria here, please, could you do the change for me? If we come back to Nigeria here, in Nigeria, the motivation, the motivation for imposing regulatory control over microfinance micro actually started from the government's desire to, 
to expedite development and accelerate, uh, accelerate modernity. Now, the informal non-governmental institutions and committee, uh, community banks in Nigeria were also the primary source of microfinance as in India. However, the newly imposed uh, legal and regulatory frameworks have done little or nothing to change the situation in Nigeria. As a matter of fact, what the kind of legal, the kind of legal framework and regulatory intervention we have in Nigeria here is more or less driven by, is not driven by innovation, but by this desire to sell and disburse licenses. That's actually what I have here. Then these smaller institutions in Nigeria would have done better, would actually do better if they are not licensed or sanctioned by the state. Because the kind of regulatory intervention we have in microfinance here in Nigeria does not support does not support the motive for the creation of microfinance in the first instance. Now, what I mean by that is this. The regulations, if you look at the CBN Act and the Banking and Other Financial Institution Act, you see that the regulations we have there for microfinance talks mainly about registration, uh, financing, composition, and whatever. Nothing, there is no, there is no provision for how loans are to be disbursed the beneficiary and how the system is to impact on the beneficiary. So at the end of the day, you, at the end of the day, the, the common cause again, the common cause mentality, what, what is driving the beneficiary, the beneficiary of the microfinance regime back to the old system in Nigeria. That is why if you go to our local market, we still have what they call os Osusu. I don't know what, whether there are a lot of foreigners here. Osusu, uh, local microfinance uh, organization that operate outside the fringes of the law. So our market women and we underserved society still rely more on this microfinance organization that operate outside the law, more than sanctioned organization in the country. And as a matter of fact, this is as a result of uh, failure of... Uh, legal framework and regulatory intervention. And that is why uh, I said initially that it is the cultural component that is the reaction, the reaction of the people to failure of regulatory framework and uh, 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 legal framework and regulatory intervention that actually drives innovation. The most legal framework we have in, in, in uh, uh, our financial sector are driven by reaction. The, our legal framework are not proactive. They are driven by reaction. It is usually the reaction of the people to a given set of circumstances that creates another set of uh, uh, regulatory framework and intervention. Now, I Five made the point minutes. that African businesses are driven by small scale industry. The point was even made there yesterday. But regulatory framework in Nigeria appears not to be driven by innovation. Key innovation in the United States of America. In the United States of America, microfinance regulations in place for years were created out of boom in, in, in the pre-crash era. There were boom in development, home business ownership, and empowerment of the lower income segment of the population. However, America suffered a massive failure of microfinance, and uh, most of the institu institutions that had enjoyed this boom earlier on, suffered massive revises. Now, within these revises, another subset or subculture was created. New regulations were necessary to fix these challenges. When the new regulation came, the new microfinance industry emerged and they started using the common cost mentality again to market their new product. Now, the common cause mentality here in America is this, that these were the set of bad guys that caused the crash in the first place. And therefore, you cannot trust them. But if you trust us, we are going to give you the money and you will not lose your home. You will not lose anything again. And that is the current situation as it is. Could, could you change it for me, please? Now, uh, the, uh, I continue here that the case studies in India, the local small scale lenders servicing a dissolution population were able to translate their pre-regulation position in the community. 
into a near monopoly on microfinance product during the transitional phase. That's in the initial phase. That is in India. Whereas in Nigeria here, the failure of government institutions to provide appropriate services secure the place of the non-government organizations in the community in anticipation of uh, better regulation. Now, back to America again, you will now discover that it is in, in America, small debt relief companies were able to make advantage, take advantage of the new legal framework designed to help the people recover from that failure. They transformed themselves into champions of rescue effort and capitalized on the disillusionment of the population with the institution that previously had their confidence. Now, what I'm trying to say here is that in America, the small debt relief companies who were able to take advantage of new legal framework designed to help the people recover from the massive crash quickly transformed themselves into champions of the rescue effort. Now, here now, they, they, they capitalize on the disillusionment of the population with institutions, that's with the big banks and big financial institutions, and, and quickly leveraging and start disbursing capital so as to take over the old position occupied by this bank whose confidence has really dipped. Now, in, in each case, cultural and social structures that had developed in response to financial climate found new opportunities for reinvention and growth within the, within the new regulation shaped by emergent common cause paradigm. In this case, cultural defense mechanism provided opportunities for innovation. Now, let me just paraphrase what I was trying to read from here because I had to change the character of my preparation. Now, what I'm trying to say in essence is that a regulatory framework does not create innovation in all cases. It does in some cases and in some climes, but in Africa here, yeah, it does not really create innovation. What creates innovation is the is the cultural response to given situation by the by target people regula uh, uh, legal framework is meant to serve. And I have given an example of India where microfinance sprang up as a result of the disillusionment of the people of India with established banks. And they had to resort, they, they had to seek loans from other micro, other non-registered microfinance institutions in India who later became established banks and financial institutions. In Nigeria here, the, the response is not driven much by disillusionment, but by the need to create development. The, the desire of the government to create speedy development led to the emergence of new microfinance uh, culture in the country. But however, because of the absence of uh, adequate legal and regulatory framework to cover this scenario, what we have is we are half registered microfinance institution operating within the law and unregistered microfinance institution op operating outside the fringes of the law. Now, this situation is a bit uh, chaotic in that the direct impact of the legal framework, which I'm using as a test case here now, the direct impact of the legal framework on microfinance development in Nigeria is nil. It is neither here nor there. May, perhaps in the future, there will, be new, there, uh, there will be need for new regulatory framework to take care of the situation. But for now, regulatory framework in Africa, especially in Nigeria here, does not really support innovation. What it does is to create common cost mentality and at the same time, uh, create a cultural response to failure of uh, legal framework in society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uhe. Um, I have some questions already, but not until the last presentation, who should drive the agenda for innovation and sustainability? I'd like to invite Inyo Nook, lead consultant for FISO Practice Consulting. Okay, um, my slides are very few. I only got a few hours to be able to put together something, but then I'll just try and drive the conversation around um, who should drive the sustainability agenda and kind of put pay to everything we've talked about for the past um, two days. One of the things about driving agendas is always who is at the forefront, um, who should be responsible for what, who does what, and what gives that person or that body um, the right to do that. And one of the things that I really want to look at um, is 
just who are the actors or the players that we should even have at the back of our minds when we begin to talk about um, the sustainability agenda and the driving of that agenda across Africa. No doubt there the, are the, the many issues that we need to consider, but I'm just going to look at the core issues that we have um, in terms of what exactly the agenda is and how or who should be driving it. And I start here first with a quote that I want you all to, to take note of because this speaks to the heart of the issue of the sustainability agenda and driving a clear-cut roadmap for Africa. And it's from the CEO of Unilever, Patrick Sesco. It said, this agenda of sustainability and corporate responsibility is not only central to business strategy, but will increasingly become a critical driver of business growth, which in other words, includes innovation. I believe that how well and how quickly businesses respond to this agenda will determine which companies succeed and which companies fail. In my opening uh, remarks yesterday, I made mention of the clear-cut difference between organizations that are doing something and organizations that will stay the test of time. And what really differentiates them is their creativity and the ability to change as the, the market changes, as they relate to their stakeholder, and how the market wants them to run. And, and I think this is what the quote is, is also talking about. And there are two ways to look at it in terms of the agenda. And I, and, and I said there are two, two um, clear-cut agendas that we're talking about on that one agenda. The people agenda, which includes developing, engaging, and attracting employees through real community and social projects. And in this case, we're looking at who are the people themselves within the businesses. And again, speaking to one of the comments I made earlier today about putting the humanness. And I think that's one of the things that, um, taking us back again, um, when Martin was talking about why we want to do the labeling for products in, in, in Africa, it's to put the humanness to everything that we're talking about. Because more and more and more, and I think it feeds also to what um, Dr. Olubas talked about, um, where we want to do things and there's no empirical evidence, no data um, for you to test the things that you're doing. There's no humanness to most of the policies that we bring out. And of course, with some of the things that organizations do, both in the public and private sector, there's some, almost always the lack of humanness to it. So that's the part that is the people agenda. And then, of course, the sustainable business agenda, where we talk about businesses maximizing the impact of engaging in society. Again, it is no longer about doing business. It's no longer about profit. It's no longer about the shareholders. It is about maximizing the impact that your business has on society. And then, of course, the role that society plays in keeping you in business. I think it's important to, 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 to clarify that intersection because more often than not, it is, oh, business, the business of business is, is business, so we're here to do business. But then we always forget that if the people, for example, do not exist, who buy your products or your services or for whom you do the business, then there is no need for a business. So that clear-cut intersection needs to be clarified in defining the agenda. And then, of course, here I'm trying to define what this agenda is. And here I'm saying the sustainability agenda begins with making a commitment to incorporating social, environmental, economic, and ethical factors into strategic decision making. And this cuts across. It is not a private sector thing. It cuts across. When we talk about decision making, we're talking about it in terms of particularly government policies. And we will see this as we go ahead in terms of who the key players are in driving the sustainability agenda. It extends to evaluating how these factors affect the society, including all its stakeholders, and what risks and opportunities these factors present. Government and business leaders who operate sustainably recognize that these factors interplay and they affect their core business strategies. Now, when we talk about business, more often than not, we, we, we always look at it from the private sector point of view. But government is business. There are certain government um, um, services that we make use of and that we pay for. So government is business. And so the issue of sustainability is also very um, core in, in the things that, that, that the government does. And here I said, 
the players. So we'll be looking at who are the people we think should be the ones driving um, the sustainability agenda on the continent. First is government, and I think one of the, 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 the points that um, Ibrahim Salao um, um, brought up was Agenda 21. Agenda 21 is a UN, um, I can't even remember the, the, the organization, UN Conference on Environment and Development in 1992 came up with this Agenda 21. And the idea was to have government engage practically on the issue of sustainable development. Now, one of the major issues was clearly a problem from the beginning. And it still speaks back to the issue of voluntary versus compliance. Agenda 21 was voluntary, and it's still very, very voluntary. And, and, and the key things that Agenda 21 was looking at was it, was it was cut into four social and economic dimensions, conservation and management of resources for development, strengthening the role of major groups within the society. So you have the NGOs, you have um, 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 some players within the private sector, and then of course it was also looking at the means of, of, of implementation. But the problem clearly from most of the analysis and, and um, um, evaluation that has gone into um, Agenda 21 was the fact that it was voluntary and governments could say, yes, we all sign up to it. In fact, during the Rio Plus 20 in, in last year, all the governments again said they, 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 they complied with Agenda 21. And what is Agenda 21 talking about? It's a non-binding, voluntarily implemented action plan of the UN with regard to sustainable development it is an action agenda for the, for the UN, other organizations, government, and all of that. And the 21 in it actually refers to the 21st century. The idea really was that in these different core areas, government will be committed to ensuring that issues of sustainable development, issues of sustainability in their policies were clearly defined and clearly stated. Five more minutes. And then, of course, we have investors as another key play, um, player in terms of driving the sustainable agenda. Now, recently, there have been a lot of calls concerning how investments, foreign direct investments, are coming into Africa. And I think another part that we've, we've, we, we always try to forget about is that indigenous companies are also investors. And more often, more, more and more, we are seeing even, uh, taking an example of Nigeria, um, we have investors from Nigeria investing in other African countries. So we have the Dangote Group, for example, investing in Tanzania and, and some other countries. And, and, and then the issue keeps looking at foreign direct investment because when they go to other countries, they become foreign direct investors as well. But there have been more and more calls about responsible investing, along with a sense of a more sophisticated understanding of investment risk. So these investments are not just coming, but they're taking into um, recognition, very key issues in the way these investments come. And then, of course, more and more of the calls are requesting for policies that guide how these investments come into countries, integrating environmental, social, and gov governance issues. And I think that's one of the things why um, I think recently um, the, the Nigerian Stock Exchange, which, which we also um, see, um, um, came about um, talking about having a, a, a corporate governance index. And, and let me say it very clearly and very openly here that um, we approached the Nigerian Stock Exchange um, a couple of months back and we said to them that we wanted um, Nigeria to put together um, a sustainable index for all the companies that were quoted on the, on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. And, and they were very willing to work with us on that. And, and I think by the time they, they, re, they, I think they only heard our name, um, Fitzer Praxis, and it sounded like one very nice foreign um, company. And then when they found out that we were one tiny a company that didn't know, <laughs> didn't have any huge presence, you know, like the, the, the Eston Youngs and, and all of that, uh, they, they, they sent us back an email to say, oh, sorry, we're going to be working with, with a foreign firm in putting together a corporate governance index. And, 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 and I'm glad they've announced it. And I hope that it is, is, it's an index that takes into consideration the clear and very different indices that exist within the African market, and particularly within the market that is very peculiar, um, like Nigeria. 
And of course, as I said, um, the stock exchange, a lot of calls as well for stock exchanges to, to, to take the lead in advancing sustainability. And, and of course, we constantly quote the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and the African market who've really helped in, in, in defining um, particularly the responsibility of companies who are quoted on the stock exchange. Within the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, there are certain guidelines. If you don't meet them, no matter how fantastic you are as a company, you are delisted until you meet them, particularly on the social responsibility index. Of course, the communities. I, I mean, more often than not, when we talk about, and I think um, one of the delegates has been hammering of this, when we talk about the public and the private sector, more often than not, we forget the people that we are really doing all of this for. And even, even the, 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 I think the conversation that Ajia and I had was more of the true engagement of the stakeholder. And I think that it's, it's a key problem that we need to do. The true, deep, and, and very serious engagement of, 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 of our stakeholders, which are, of course, in communities where we operate, in terms of the policies and the things that either businesses or government need to do, it's so important. Because at the end of the day, it still comes back to the issue when you have no data, no empirical evidence, you are just creating policies that are not innovative and cannot stand the test of time. Academic institutions, more and more we are seeing that um, the need to constantly, constantly guide discussions and, and thought leadership on, on what the trends should be in Africa and what we should be talking about and, and constantly reiterating it's so important. And of course, most importantly, working as support organizations, um, um, uh, support institutions with organizations in creating the data and, and, and the evidence that we need in the work that we do. The big question really finally is who then should drive the agenda um, for innovation and sustainability? And I just have three um, things on the matrix here. Of course, multilateral organizations, non-governmental organizations, and the private sector. Yesterday, when Bill Sherman was talking about, uh, was, was giving his presentation, he, he showed us how one single person can create such a huge buzz around what an organization is, is doing, and it rattles that organization. And I think that it's, it's important that non-governmental organizations begin to look at the role that they have to play in pushing forward linking the other uh, part of the matrix in, in, in driving the, the, the agenda in Africa. What is the role of governments of Africa in driving so a sustainability minutes, agenda? Yeah. Of course, again, it still boils down to what I said, that they must be the ones that are at the forefront in terms of the policies that they do. And, not, and, and I think one of the issues that I've always had with African gov government generally and, 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 and I saw more of this when I worked in the African Union um, for four years, and you were always attending this um, 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 summit of the heads of state of the African Union and seeing them all there sitting down. Half of the time they are asleep while the, the summit is going on. The 53 heads of state, they are asleep. It's the ambassadors that are doing the work. And, but when it comes to ratifying and signing and adopting whatever it is that they all agree,